this morning, we have started a new series on the Forgotten God. Now, for some of you, you may recognize that title, and when Sam used that title, it's just to remind us this is not a a take on Francis Chan's book by the same name, but what it is is a reminder for us. For us, as followers of Jesus, there is a thing that Orthodox Christians have confessed for a long time now. The God is one in essence or being three in subsistences. There are three persons within the wise Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. And for us, it is so easy for us to identify Father and Son, I think, because we have natural parallels and metaphors to look around and understand those relationships. But when it comes to God the Holy Spirit, I've heard it said that he is the cousin it of the Trinity, Nobody's quite sure how to define him. No one's quite sure how to engage him. No one is quite sure how to think of him. But I want you to know that just as the Father is God, so the Son is God, so the Spirit is God. And so Pastor Sam began this series last week, and I commend it to you if you haven't listened to that. And in Luke chapter 11, Jesus said, If you being evil know how to give your children good gifts, then how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit if we ask. And so when it comes to this, what a marvelous thing for us to consider today. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to the book of Acts. This is the companion volume to Luke's gospel called Acts. We're going to be in chapter 2. We're going to look at something that is transformative and redemptive history. It changed things forever. Some of you are the list makers in the room, you are the calendar watchers in the room, and you are already beginning to feel the strain of the Advent season approaching. Some of you have already counted how many days it is until Christmas, and there will come this season where it seems like we will be strapped to a cannon and fired out. And we won't be able to keep up with schedules. We're going to be so busy, but we're going to have that realization that the advent of Christ changed everything. And I want you to know that this morning we are going to talk about the advent of the Holy Spirit. And that changed everything. This is one of those things for us that depending on your denominational background and where you have come from, we have these two different ways of looking at God the Holy Spirit and understanding him. There are these two different sides that sometimes we fall into error. There are those who are deathly afraid of the Holy Spirit. And as I grew up in a small Southern Baptist church in East Texas, I'm fairly certain that if anyone's hand got above their waist that there might be a deacon or two to tackle them in the pews and haul them out. There are others that you see where it's like the music starts and now we have suddenly began a dance troupe that goes absolutely insane with no order in any place at all. And the reality for us is I think sometimes we confuse these different sides for God who has revealed himself in the pages of sacred scripture. When it comes to God the Holy Spirit, he has not left himself unknown. He has not left himself open for us to just take and make any sort of idea or concept out of him that we wish. But he has revealed himself through scripture. The the promise of the Holy Spirit has been there from the beginning. The knowledge and the revelation of the Holy Spirit has been there from the beginning. Genesis 1 tells us that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters of the deep. Proverbs 1, 23 reminds us that in this promise that if you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you and I will make my words known to you. Isaiah 32, until the spirit is poured upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field and the fruitful field is then deemed a forest. Ezekiel 36, and I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Three chapters later, I will not hide my face anymore from them when I pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel, declares the Lord. Later on in Acts 2, beyond where we will read this morning, Peter, by the unction of the Holy Spirit, begins to interpret the minor prophet Joel and explain that what they are seeing on that day is God's spirit being poured out on all mankind, ushering in the last days, and John the Baptist the close. The Old Testament prophet said that there is one coming, and he's going to baptize you with water and with fire, speaking of the Holy Spirit. So this morning, as we come to think of this, I want you to know this is an advent that changed everything. 
This is something that absolutely turned the world order upside down. This is something that for us, we are remiss in our understanding of who God is and how we relate to him if we don't get our arms around this forgotten God. So today, we're going to pick up in in, in Acts chapter 2, but Luke doesn't give us a whole lot of details in the interim. If you're a student of Scripture, that that first volume in his gospel, the gospel of Luke, as he ends, he ends and there's this ascension and there are these instructions, but he doesn't tell us a whole lot. He picks it right back up in Acts chapter 1. But there are some important things to note that the risen Christ standing amongst his disciples begins to tell them and help them to understand this is how Moses and the prophets, they spoke of me in these ways and he gave them understanding to the scripture. And so I would just encourage you, don't be too quick to unhitch yourself from the Old Testament for Jesus himself says that they speak of him. When it comes to this understanding that we see at the end, this risen Christ, this Messiah of God, Jesus Christ the righteous, having finished everything that the Father sent him to do, tells his disciples, you're going to be clothed with power. Now for us, we start thinking of being clothed with power, and many images may come to mind. Some of you may be thinking of Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. Others of you are thinking about some armor that you put on that makes one invincible. There are different things, but Christ tells these men, I'm going to leave, but there is one coming, this promised, blessed Holy Spirit, and he's going to clothe you with power. And when Acts picks back up the same idea as they are walking out to see the risen Christ, they are headed out, but he tells them, you're going to receive power from on high, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And so into this, the disciples are there, Christ ascends back, and they go back to the upper room, and they're just there waiting. And this is where we pick up in our text for today, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says this, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, ah, they're filled with new wine. May God bless the reading of his word, receive his powerful living and active word this day. The disciples are there. Their master, their rabbi, has gone from them. But he has come back, just as he said, after three days. There's been a 40-day period that they have spent together. They have seen all kinds of things. This body that Christ has forever taken to himself is indeed that, a body prepared for him. The first fruits of a new kind of body, a a resurrection body, a, a resurrection life. They have seen him eat. They have seen him come into rooms where there were closed doors. They have heard him speak, but he has been telling them, I am going to send you this one. It is better for me to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you without hope. I'm not just going to leave you to sit and wonder what it is that you are to do. I'm not going to leave you here helpless. Oh no, I am sending one who will come. and He will clothe you with power from on high. And that power will enable, equip you to be able to be my witnesses. Not just in Jerusalem, but in Judea. And unthinkably, 
Samaria, your enemies, and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so, here they are, and the day of Pentecost has come. Now, when it comes to Pentecost, for many, we hear that and we recognize it's one of the three high holy feast days that all Jewish males were required to appear in Jerusalem. And so what would happen is this was normally the best attended one because of the time of year in which it took place. The weather was normally the best. It was called Pentecost because it was 50 days after Passover. We must not miss that as we read the Old Testament and we see these pictures and these types unfold before us, it is not by accident that Jesus Christ is called our Passover lamb. It was not by accident that John the Baptist called him, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It is no wonder that Paul calls him our Paschal lamb. And so there are 50 days removed. The day of Pentecost comes. Now the day of Pentecost is the feast of the first fruits. This was the recognition that whatever the ground had produced had been produced by the creator who causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. This was the celebration of the kindness, goodness, and favor of God poured out on his people as he sustains them, giving them bread and sustenance and everything that they need. And so their rabbi, their friend, their king and their savior having ascended back They'd gone, the upper room, and they're just they're waiting. They're giving themselves to the scripture. They're giving themselves to, to prayer. They are regularly going to the temple with joy. There is a confidence and an anticipation. And then suddenly on the day of Pentecost, the advent of the Holy Spirit comes, and it comes in an unmistakable way, and it comes in a way that it changed the world forever. It says that suddenly there was... This sound, they're all together, but there's this sound. It's a violent and rushing wind. It was not just audible to this group that's assembled in the room. It was audible all over the city for the multitude could hear it, and they gathered to find out exactly what it was. And to this company of apostles and those believers, this 120 that were there, by the way, that is one of the ways that the Older Testament says that this can be a community for 120 and councils to be established. And they're in that company, emerging from the upper room and stepping out. There is a visible manifestation that for the Jews and the proselytes, for these who had come from all over the diaspora, the scattering of the Jews, they witnessed something to their eyes that is difficult to describe. Fire comes with this violent wind that is so powerful and so noisy that it comes and it begins to split and it rests right over each individual. For the Jews that were there, their minds begin to spin with all of the truth that they had heard from the time that they were small. These times when God had manifest himself in fire. These times where in the tabernacle, when finally constructed and and done as God had prescribed, the fire of God fell. This time of the temple when the fire of God fell, consuming all of these things. Clouds of heaviness. Moses on Mount Sinai as the mountain burns as if it is on fire. This furious, consuming fire, God manifesting himself in flames. Suddenly, flames come. But this is different. This is not just geographical. This this was not based on some sort of just location or place, no matter how symbolic. No, this fire spread. And it rested over the heads of these men. And it was no question for them that this was the very presence of God. But they were very confused and frightened and afraid. And as we read Luke's account of this, how do you describe fire? How do you describe light and heat and intensity as it dances above? And the best thing that he can come out with is he calls it a tongue of fire as it laps up everything around it. But then something happens. This fire was not just given as a visual representation. This wind and power that came violently with the advent of the Holy Spirit coming, it was not just given so that people could gaze upon it as some kind of iconic relic that now they could just look back and say, I remember this points to something else. No, it rested and it empowered these men. 
And these men were Galileans. Now, the Galileans were not the educated of the day. Galileans were simple country folk. They were the rednecks that were not educated. And when these Galileans suddenly began to give utterance to these mighty works of God, people took notice. They were going, wait, I I recognize these words. This is my own dialect. This is my own language where I've come from. Whether it be, you know, in Rome, whether it be in Persia, whether it be in Mesopotamia, whether it be from any other place, suddenly they are hearing these words, and all these words are the same. They are declaring the mighty acts of God. Bewildered, they step back and they wonder, what does this mean, and how can this be? And even for the proselytes, those who had come to Jewish faith, they're confused. What are we supposed to do with this? There's, there's this noise, and now we gather, and there are men standing here, and there's fire over them. And they're speaking, and I recognize what they're saying, and they're declaring the mighty acts of the one true and living God. And into this confusion, there are some who are just trying to figure out what it means, and then there are others because they're always the skeptics. There are always those who are very modern, who are seeking some sort of natural understanding for why supernatural things happen, or to put it in today's vernacular, the haters always going to hate. And so, what causes uneducated men to be able to speak in multiple tongues? Well, obviously, they're drunk. Because people who are drunk, their speech is so clear and easy to understand. What an unreasonable assumption! But when it comes to this sort of thing, is their confusion much different than ours? The reality for us is often within the confines of the church, particularly depending on what our denominational bend, we have these places where within the Godhead we have pushed aside God the Holy Spirit. Now let us not say that we can overemphasize things, but I do think that sometimes we ignore I think that sometimes for us, you know, we get in this liturgical sense and we point to the Father who decreed all these things, Ephesians chapter 1, and we marvel at his wisdom and goodness in that. We spend so much time in this redemptive history narrative called the Bible where we understand that God has been working out this plan that he laid before the foundation of the world and in working that out, the apex of his revelation in Jesus Christ, coming, accomplishing everything That he came to do. We marvel at his death, his burial, and we celebrate his resurrection. For without the resurrection, we have nothing. But I think that sometimes we are remiss in paying attention to what the advent of the Holy Spirit really means for us. Why in the world would our Savior and our champion, the author, the perfecter of our faith, this Jesus the Christ, why in the world could it? Would he say to his disciples, it's better that I leave you? How can it be better? Jesus, you're, you're the one who has the words of life, Peter said. But you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And we believe. How can it be better for him to leave? This is the promise that God has been working out all along. For you see, in the divine economy, there is nothing that is wasted. And this Holy Spirit had been promised. This Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal, God of very God, Holy Spirit had always been a part of the plan. But This is where things would change forever. For you see, as those Jews and proselytes and those gathered in Jerusalem, the city having swollen to probably three or four times its normal population due to this high feast day, there in the midst of this multitude where they begin to hear with their own ears and their own dialect the mighty works of God, it conjures up these Older Testament images. Where the prophet Ezekiel goes and he just sees this valley filled with the evidence and remains of violence. A battle that had long taken place and was over with bones dry and separated. Where God wanted people to begin, his people to begin to understand. And he says to Ezekiel, can these bones live again? 
And I love Ezekiel's answer. Well, you know, Lord. So I want you to prophesy to these bones. And all of a sudden, the wind begins to sweep. The clattering of old bones in decay. They begin to organize themselves and come back together, sinews sprouting, muscles growing until covered with flesh as the very breath of God sweeps across them and a vast army stands to its feet with life. The same spirit in Ezekiel, and in Exodus 15, as Moses looks out and Pharaoh's armies approach, the strong wind that had separated the Red Sea suddenly changes direction as the Lord fights for his people. And now on the day of Pentecost, to Galilean men who had followed Jesus, this violent wind comes and flames come and the purpose was to declare the mighty acts of God. Peter transformed from the guy who seems like he understands and then he doesn't understand. The one who is he's so impulsive and he doesn't always think things through. Suddenly he is now a scholar able to elicit understanding from the prophet Joel and articulate prophesying. This is exactly what was promised. These are the last days. This is the new part of the eschaton. This is the spirit poured out. Nothing will be the same. We are now in the last phase until consummated in the kingdom. We have the already but not yet. And it has come by this promised Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit changes things. It changes things forever. Pastor Sam talked about the fact that in the Older Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people for a specific purpose, but they didn't permanently indwell them. They didn't relate in the same way. And yet now in the Newer Testament, talking with Nicodemus, you've got to be born of water and of spirit. And talking with a Samaritan woman, you must worship in spirit and in truth. What is it about God the Holy Spirit that happened at Pentecost that changed redemptive history forever? There are several things that we could talk about. The fulfillment of this kind of first fruits at Pentecost. How is it that on this day of the advent of the Holy Spirit, oh, there would be a harvest, an ingathering, 3,000 souls in a day. And we can talk about all of these promises that were fulfilled. We can talk about the evidence of God's work in the lives of these disciples. But as we go through this, we would be remiss if we don't understand that this Holy Spirit Advent gives us a new way to relate to God by the Holy Spirit. This is the application of the new covenant ushering in a new union with Christ in a new way of relating to God. This is the outpouring of the truth that God had always said. He is the God of the nations and now to the Gentiles. Salvation is being heard. And so as we come to this place, what does this mean for us, well, there's so many things. One, this promised Holy Spirit coming. I, I want you to know, Peter goes on in his sermon. If you've not had a chance to read it, I encourage you this afternoon, take verse 14 and walk it on through. Suddenly, Peter says, I want you to understand this Holy Spirit is the vindication of Jesus Christ the righteous. You can find this in 1 Timothy 3. He was vindicated by the Spirit. You see, Christ had done exactly what the Father commanded him to do. Christ had risen from the dead. Christ had ascended back to the right hand of the Father. And this high priest didn't have to stand in ministry anymore. He was able to sit down because it was all complete. And his vindication comes as the promised Holy Spirit appears in fire and appears in sound of rushing wind. This vindication of Jesus Christ, as Peter would later go on to say, you killed the author of life, but I want you to know that Father, Son, and Spirit in perfect unity and harmony and community after three days resurrected our King and our champion. The Holy Spirit changes everything. The Holy Spirit has come in Christ's stead. 
Christ says, I'm going to send him to you. He will be with you. You will walk in him. The Holy Spirit has come in Christ's stead. I'm curious, because I know for me, growing up, this is one of those things, when you pray and you address your prayers, do you ever stop to consider, is the person that I'm addressing correct? Often we will say things like, Father, we will say things like Jesus or Son, but when was the last time you addressed the Holy Spirit as you came to your Bible reading for the day, recognizing that you need him for illumination? When was the last time that you recognized that your prayers, because of the Spirit indwelling you, your prayers by the Spirit through the Son mediating on our behalf, bringing them to our Father. When was the last time you recognized that the Holy Spirit is the seal of our union with Christ? We belong to him. And the evidence that we belong to him comes by the Spirit as he bears this fruit in increasing measure. The evidence to the communities and families around us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The evidence that we are walking in the Spirit by the way that we love each other. By the way that we can see his outpouring manifest among us. Oh, dear friends, I need you to know this forgotten God is God of very God. God, the Holy Spirit, this agent of regeneration, taking the heart of stone when I was dead in my trespasses and sins. As we saw on the screen, that's when God commended his love for us in that, in this. Christ died. I could not save myself. I could not regenerate my heart. It was all his work. And now the advent of Christ in the fullness of time, God sending forth his son, so too in the fullness of time, God pouring out his spirit. It is by the spirit, Romans tells us, that I can say, Abba, Father. You see, I I need for you to understand that for those of us who have grown up in church, and we know, yes, blessed Trinity, we got it, Father, Son, and Spirit, the words roll out. The doctrine seems to be confusing. It seems, how can three be one? And we wander around, and we often transform our worship into a modalistic thing where we just focus on Father for a little bit, and then maybe later we ignore Father, focus on Son, and we forget that this blessed Trinity, that each of them in the divine economy accomplishes the very thing that they were intended to do and Jesus said I will send to you the comforter the guide and you will be clothed with power from on high now power makes us nervous we we have seen the misuse and abuse of this doctrine we have seen charlatans who claim a power that they do not have only to find out when investigated that it's not true We've seen modern day things where people to extort money from people who are desperate needing healing will manipulate them in a false enterprise that looks nothing like what scripture prescribes. Oh, but dear friends, I need for you to understand, you must not understand God the Holy Spirit by the abuse and misuse of scripture. You must understand him as he has revealed himself. You will be clothed with power. Now, I need for you to understand, believer, you have a power at residence within you. Now, some of you need to not go ahead and and misuse this and think, well, now this is all about me, and it's time for me to go ahead and get under my little eyeballs, Philippians 4.13. I can do anything, including win a baseball game, a football game, or whatever it may be. That's not what this power is about. Jesus said, you will receive power so that you can be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts, we have power. How can we witness for anything? Because this power that we are clothed with is a power from on high, and it is power over sin. We live in a society that says everyone is a victim. But I need for you to know if you are in Christ, God, the Holy Spirit in you, clothes you with power. There is a power over sin. Sin has been defeated. There's no sting for death anymore. 
Because by God the Holy Spirit, not only is Christ's finished work applied and my sin removed and my forgiveness complete, but the Holy Spirit applying that finished work clothes me in his righteousness so that on the day of the Lord when I stand before him and I have nothing to plead of any good work that I have done or anything that I have tried to accomplish, on the day I will stand before him as a son and I will be complete, not because of any power of my own, but because of the power that clothes me, the Holy Spirit uniting me with Christ so that his righteousness is mine. I will stand before God clean because of his power listen to me christian you don't have to be subject to sin you do not have to be its slave we must put to death the deeds of the flesh we must mortify and fight our sin but i need you to know greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world I need you to know that not only am I free from sin's penalty, I'm free from its power and by God's grace one day because of God the Holy Spirit applying that finished work mediated by Christ Jesus the righteous, I will stand before my Father complete, glorified, fit for heaven. It is the Spirit who holds me fast in sanctification is the Spirit that gives me power during this process of becoming like Jesus. It is the Spirit who works in me. It is a power, not my own. That is why I can pray and say on every Sunday morning, God, you have to take this weak servant. I don't have anything that's my own. If there's anything good that comes from this, it is because of what Christ has done, and it is because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Sam and I, in praying this week and thinking through this, we can stand up here and recite passage after spa- passage. We can tell you doctrine after doctrine, but if the Holy Spirit fire does not come through these words, there will be no transformation transformation of souls. We rely and plead upon the mercy of God that he would release his power by the Holy Spirit. This empowerment of Christ is for missions. It's for missions. I am in Christ, sealed by the promised Holy Spirit, kept until the day of his appearing, but it is so that I can be his witness. You see, for a lot of us, we think that the Holy Spirit, then we got to turn our focus, and it's whatever I can get from him, however I can use him for my own selfish gain. But what Christ has said is, listen, you're going to be clothed with power from on high, and the purpose of that clothing with power is to make much of Jesus. I just wonder how many times we sit in this room I wonder if God the Holy Spirit is not calling some of you to go to an unreached people group or away from this place. I wonder how many times that instead of saying, oh God, the Spirit, help me to understand what is it that you would have me to do. I wonder how many times we even think to address him at all. Just forgotten God. Say, okay, John, so what does this mean for me today? Here's what this means. I want you to know, if you are here, some of you are like, John, you don't, you don't know me. You don't know what I'm bringing from my past. You don't know how dark it is. You don't know what the skeletons in that closet look like. You do not understand my failure. That is true. I cannot fully understand the places that you have walked, but I can tell you this. There is a power greater than your failure, your skeletons, and your darkness. I can tell you this, that when the light of the world came into the world, the darkness couldn't comprehend it and it couldn't overcome it. I can tell you this, that when Holy Spirit fire comes into the individual who who is dead in their trespasses and sins, he regenerates a heart of stone and he gives them a heart of flesh and he writes his name and his law upon your heart. Some of you are going, yeah, but John, you don't understand. I I know I'm in Christ, but I just haven't been walking well lately. Then plead upon the Spirit and lean upon His power. Believe that He is able. See what He can do through simple Galileans. 
Remember, this promised Holy Spirit, this advent of his coming at Pentecost, this ushers in the last days. People say, when are the last days? Congratulations. Everything from Pentecost forward is. His day is approaching, the furious day of the Lord, when he will be revealed by fire again. But until that day, oh my dear ones, those of you who are here and you have tried to be religious and you know stuff about Jesus, but your heart has never been transformed, I need for you to know you are not saved by knowledge. I need for you to know that you are not saved by religion. I need for you to know that you are not saved by works. You are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God by the gift of the Holy Spirit taking what is dead in sin and raising it unto glorious life. It is not about how much you know or how good you you are. It is about what Christ has done and what you are offered through him by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us a new way to relate to God. This indwelling God, this forgotten God inside of us, sealing our union with Christ guaranteeing our day of redemption and glorification. We don't live as victims. We belong to Jesus. There is nothing that he cannot do, and there is nothing that he does not know. But this advent of the Holy Spirit is not for ourselves. It is for others. And I would submit to you this. The task is not yet complete in world missions. And so the power of the Holy Spirit is still valid for today. I bid you this day, look to Christ. Plead upon his mercy so that by the Spirit, through the Son, you can be rescued from your sin and set free. Well, the advent of the Spirit changed everything. Let us not forget God of very God, God the Holy Spirit.